In the last crippets, we spoke about obstructive shock. And in this crippets, we're going to talk about cardiogenic shock. In cardiogenic shock, we have a problem with the pump. So that can be a decrease in our stroke volume, or it can be a decrease in our heart rate. Because remember, cardiac output, or the pump, is heart rate times stroke volume. For cardiogenic shock, the compensatory mechanism is to increase the tank, increase the intravascular status. And that happens because as the pump goes down, the kidneys sense that there's less perfusion, and they think that there's hypovolemia happening. So they start to retain water and they retain salt. And that's why we have a compensation by increasing the tank. The other compensation that happens are the pipes clamp down. And we increase systemic vascular resistance or increase the resistance on the pipes in order to maintain a perfusion pressure. These are the compensatory mechanisms that happen as our pump goes down. And over time, these can also fail. When we talk about cardiogenic shock, there's really four things that you need to think about. A failure of diastolic function, failure of systolic function, arrhythmias, and problems with the valves. Diastolic dysfunction just simply means that the heart can't relax. And if it can't relax, then it can't fill. And if it can't fill, you get a decrease in your cardiac output. Systolic dysfunction is where we'll spend the most amount of time on, and this is just simply when the heart can't pump. This can be a problem with the right ventricle, or it can be a problem with the left ventricle. Arrhythmias, is when the heart goes too fast, such as VTAC or AFib with RVR, or too slow, as we have with bradycardias. Either of these problems can cause trouble with cardiac output, and thus, shock. And finally, valves. And as I said before, some people will include stenotic valves in part of this algorithm for cardiogenic shock, but I put it in my obstructive basket. What I'm speaking about here with valves is an incompetent valve, and that means things like tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonic insufficiency, mitral regurgitation, and aortic insufficiency. Any one of these is going to decrease the forward flow to the next chamber of the heart, or in this case, the aorta, and thus decreasing cardiac output. So let's go through those four things again. When you have a problem of diastolic dysfunction, as could happen with an infiltrative disease, let's just say amyloidosis, the heart cannot relax as it normally does, and thus we have a decrease in our filling, which equals a decrease in our stroke volume. The main way we talk about systolic dysfunction is a decrease in the actual pump itself. And this can either be a problem with our right ventricle or our left ventricle. This can be from myocardial infarction. Again, this can be from infiltrative diseases. This can be from a dilated cardiomyopathy. Any way that you get here, these pumps just simply don't work, and this leads to a reduction in our cardiac output. The way we treat it is to treat the underlying cause, and then after that, we need to support the patient. You might want to use inotropes such as dobutamine or low-dose epi, and things like milrinone as well. If chemical inotropy doesn't work, then you may have to move on to some mechanical things, things like impella, intraaortic balloon pump, or VA ECMO. Oh, and don't forget about LVADs or RVADs. The point here is you actually have to cause increased contractility of that heart. If you can do it by a chemical means, that's great. But sometimes these chemical means might just be a bridge into getting these patients definitive mechanical circulatory support. Now, don't forget, if we're talking about myocardial infarction, you have to get that coronary artery reperfused. And whether that's by using thrombolytics or even better, getting them to the cath lab. But cardiogenic shock is an indication for that person to get immediate reperfusion therapy. Call your cardiologist early on these cases so that they can mobilize because until you fix this pump, you're not fixing that shock. The next thing we'll talk about are arrhythmias. Remember that cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. And we spend a lot of time talking about problems with the stroke volume, but don't forget the heart rate itself can be a problem. Let's start off with things that can make you too slow, like heart blocks. Third degree heart block is something where the ventricular escape rhythm is too slow for the person's cardiac output. Think about overdoses that affect the SA node, things like beta blocker toxicity or calcium channel blockers. This causes the sinus node to move so slowly that it's not meeting the body's metabolic needs. This person wants to have a higher blood pressure, higher cardiac output. However, they can't increase their rate intrinsically as they normally do. 
We can also have problems if the heart goes too fast. So these would be things like SVTs, AFib with RVR. Here the heart can't fill properly, so we have a reduction in our stroke volume. We can also have things like ventricular tachycardias or ventricular fibrillation where the heart's actually not really moving at all. It's just kind of wiggling along. But either way, we have a heart that's beating too fast. And when these patients are in shock, the only medicine that you need to give these people is electricity. Shock these people early when you have a person that's going too fast. And we probably should talk about what to do when patients are too slow. When they're too slow, you need to speed them up. Always look to fix the underlying cause and provide antidotes, which we won't cover in this crippets. But you need to speed up that heart also. But there's other agents that are chronotropics or increase the heart rate. Those are things like isopril. And if this fails, then you're going to have to pace this person, whether that's transcutaneously, but more definitively, transvenous pacers. And finally, if you have a problem with the valves, regurgitant lesion specifically, blood can effectively move forward into the next chamber and lead to cardiac output. So if you have a problem with tricuspid regurgitation, when it's severe, blood keeps going from the right atrium to the right ventricle, but then goes right back into the right atrium, and it can never get over to the left side of the heart. Similarly, when you have someone who has mitral regurgitation or aortic insufficiency, blood can't get to where it needs to be. These patients can be extremely challenging to manage when they present acutely. What they really need is surgery to fix that valve. So everything you do is just a temporizing measure. You're still going to do the things that you normally do when you resuscitate these patients. You're going to put them on vasopressors like norepinephrine because you're looking to ensure adequate perfusion to the distal tissues while you're on the phone with your surgeons to get them to the OR.